welcome to Garden Success with Skip Richter, the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Skip Richter. Well, hello and welcome to Garden Success. Uh, wow. Look outside. This is a this is a welcome change. Uh, hopefully, you're getting a little bit of rain in your area and will over the coming couple of days. Uh, but it sure is good to even have the temperatures drop like they have. This is a this is a lot of help for our plants. Uh, this summer's heat and drought went on too long, and we've lost plants, and we've got a lot of plants that are basically teetering on the edge of death. Uh, and then we have a lot of plants that are severely stressed, and we're going to be dealing with some issues with that in the months to come. I'll talk about that more later. I mean, th that's a lot of depressing news, right? So don't run out and hang yourself with a garden hose or fall on your hoary hoary knife. Uh, we, we, will, we have a way out of this, and we'll talk about some of the things we can do. Uh, and uh, I'll just mention, first of all, our phone number, 979 845 5689-845-5689 or if you want to email me uh, that way you can attach a photo and really sharp focus and please attach, attach it rather than embed it into the text. It's fast and easy for me to zoom in and look at the photo that way. Garden success, one word, garden success at tamu dot edu. Well have you ever heard it said the cobbler's kids go barefoot? <laughs> That's true with the horticulturist plants. Um, this uh, summer, I've been on the road a lot, and a uh, number of long trips, traveling and being gone and away, and there's areas of my lawn that I didn't get watered. Didn't They just didn't get watered. And as a result, I started to see death in those areas. I've got some areas I'm going to have to replace. Uh, but that's if that was all it was, well, we could deal with that. But I've kind of got the trifecta of late summer lawn issues. And uh, so uh, the other thing that happened is I was out in my grass the, about a few days ago, parting the grass, looking down on the surface of the soil, just kind of curious if there were some chinch bugs involved. And there were. There were. There's a lot of immature chinch bugs, and there are a lot of adult chinch bugs. Uh, you can go online. Uh, there is a chinch bug publication uh, with the Aggie Turf website. If you go to Aggie Turf, I believe it's, it's the chinch bug there. I know on AgriLife Learn. Let me give you those two emails. Always listen to this show, please, with a pen and paper handy because we give you out information for really good resources. So if you go to aggieturf.tamu.edu, Aggie Turf is one word, down in the bottom left hand side, there are some, uh, there's information on weeds and insects, and there's some publications, and all of those are very good resources. Uh, if you want to get publications on a variety of things, from diseases to insects to horticultural plants and so on, you can go to AgriLife Learn, and that's one word, agrilifelearn.tamu.edu. And type in what you're looking for, you'll see a PDF publication. The vast majority of everything on there is free. I mean, if it's a little booklet or something, you, you need to pay for that. Uh, but most of it just appears in your email box as a download once you go through the process. Uh, so you can find out what chinch bugs look like. A Google search can also show you that. Well, I said it was a trifecta. So the other part of the trifecta is take all root rot. I dug up some runners, took them in, looked at them under a scope, and I had this confirmed with Dr. Ong at the state plant clinic. Uh, it is take all root rot on my grass. Then take all is a good name because it takes it all. When you kill roots, you kill grass. And so these um, these grass runners are dying, and I need to deal with all of it. And so I've got a number of things I'm doing. Uh, some things I'm kind of experimental playing with. Probably not talk about those because I don't want people to go out and say he said on the radio to go to, <laughs> go do this because I'm not. Uh, but uh, for example, on the on the uh, drought dieback, well, water the grass and and pray for rain. And here came some. Hopefully, we'll get some more uh, before too long. Uh, so th that's easy. I mean, well, that's simple, uh, I guess, the, the solution for it. For chinch bugs, uh, you need to jump in early, way earlier than I am now, uh, with an um, insecticide that you put in the lawn, and it gets down there in the thatch where the chinch bugs hang out, 
and uh, it kills them. And uh, stopping it early is important because, again, they start, it's almost like a wildfire. You know, if someone throws a uh, match or cigarette out on the roadside and it catches the roadside and then it goes into the forest, and now you have this wildfire that's burning outward from that point of origination. And that's how it is with chinch bugs. They suck the grass and, and they inject poisons into the grass, toxins, I should say, uh, and it dies. And they don't sit there in dead grass and starve to death. They move outward a little bit and they do more and then they do more. And you just see this like it needs watering, but it gradually moves further and further out. Uh, typically, not 100% of the time, but typically chinch bugs begin at a sidewalk, a driveway, a curb, some kind of a masonry structure in the sun. They, I've never seen one uh, just pop up in the shade. Uh, so typically in sunny areas, so that therefore they often get mistaken for drought because you know drought is going to be much harder on your St. Augustine out in the sun than it will be in the shade. You need to water much less in, in a shady area to keep the grass alive than you do in the sun. So they can kind of hide under the cover of drought damage, but there they are. So I'm going to be putting out uh, today between rainstorms uh, an insecticide down on the ground in that turf area try to shut those things down uh, before they go any further. For the take all root rot, uh, we have a number of things that we can do. If you, uh, there are fungicides, there is primarily a couple of them that work better than others, uh, but if you will um, give us contact at the AgriLife Extension Office there, I can actually provide you with some other information. Uh, also, if you want to deal with take-all patch, at the agrilifelearn.tamu.edu website, put in take-all root rod or take-all patch or something, and you'll find that publication. At the end of it, it lists the pesticides. So I could say a name on the air, and, you know, it's kind of hard to remember to write it down. Just go there and get that publication, because that'll help you read about take-all patch to learn about take-all patch. Uh, and what to do about it. But the time to deal with it, typically, uh, the best time is in the spring, but I wouldn't wait till spring. I would do something now, uh, now in October, uh, because uh, it likes to infect primarily during cooler parts of the year, but we see decline in our grass even during the warm parts of the year because as it kills roots and the temperature goes up and it quits raining, well, that puts grass under a a big problem, right? And so we see damage from it all through the summer. Uh, but uh, I would do that treatment in this fall and then come back with it again in uh, in the spring, just to be sure. Uh, there's been some research that showed uh, peat moss put out at one bale of peat moss. That's a compacted uh, brick-looking, giant brick-looking bag. Uh, one of those, it's I think 3.8 cubic feet. Uh, per thousand square feet of lawn helps to suppress it. You need to put it down and then water it in. It needs to be wet, wet and uh, watered. And peat moss, dry peat moss is hard to get wet. And so, to, you know, just kind of work with it. A few applications, you can get it wet. That that has been helpful in suppressing it. Uh, there's some other things I'm going to be trying this year uh, just because uh, we need some better, simpler solutions to this disease. And I know researchers are working on a lot of different things. But there it is. There's the trifecta. Now, if that wasn't enough, by the way, here's our phone number, 979-845-5689. Uh, 979-845-5689. Or by email, gardensuccess at tamu dot edu. Now, they tell me don't keep talking because then people don't call. Just... <laughs> Be quiet a minute, and uh, and I'll wrap up the topic uh, and get get some calls in. So interrupt me whenever you want. I won't forget what I'm talking about. We'll we'll continue with this topic as we go through the day or through the hour. Um, so I mentioned the trifecta that we've been dealing with. Now we've got a new one coming in, uh, and that is large patch, which we have always called brown patch. It's very confusing because there actually still is a brown patch, but it's not the thing that we used to call brown patch. <laughs> How do you like that? Uh, large patch. I'm going to call it large patch because uh, that is its proper name now. But just if you've in the past thought about that's brown patch, those circles in the fall. 
you know, we get a little cool weather, a little front moves through. I don't mean 90 degree cool, I mean cooling off a little bit more. Uh, and uh, the um, front moves through, get a little bit of rain, and boom, these big circles start to appear. October is a big month where we see a lot of that kind of thing. It can uh, bleed out into other months depending on the weather. But anyway, large patch then comes in and, and adds insult to injury. Now, fortunately, the good news about large patch is that if you um, uh, have not had it in the past in your lawn much, like the likelihood of you having it is, is lower than someone who just year after year is having large patch problems. But that's significant because we don't wait until we see circles. We have to treat before we see circles. And so the time to do that, uh, again, it could be very late in September. You could do it in early October, but don't wait. Or maybe if the first start of a circle, go ahead and get the treatment on. Uh, because once the circles appear, what's happened is the disease, large patch, has rotted the grass blades off of the runner. And so the runners are green and healthy, uh, you know, considering they don't have any leaves now. Uh, but they will sit there all winter because it's it's too cool through our cool season for grass to grow much. And so you get to live with the big brown circles all through the winter until spring re-green up begins and they fill back in. But it's not killing the grass. That's the good news is uh, uh, large patch doesn't usually kill the grass. Maybe if it's part of a lot of other problems that the grass is dealing with, I guess it could be part of what takes the grass down. But in general, it rots the leaves off and the grass regreens. And it's ugly, but that's what it does. So you got to get ahead of time, and there's a number of fungicides on that. There's also a publication on that. Uh, I have not checked Aggie uh, Turf lately. There's probably publications on large patch in fact, I'm pretty sure there is. But I know on AgriLife Learn, there's publications on a number of different disease things, and including take all and large patch, probably. So anyway, that's what we do for it. So I would say in the, I don't know in how many years I've not used a pesticide on my lawn. And that, that includes herbicides, uh, fungicides, insecticides. I just haven't. I've just focused on having a good, dense lawn and taking care of it. And a lawn like that can tolerate a little bit of problems here and there. But this year, due to the combination of drought and my traveling away and it not being cared for, uh, a lot of things have hit that I'm now having to deal with. So in years of not doing anything to control insects, disease, and weeds, now I get to do all three. Uh, and anytime your lawn gets thin, weeds are going to come in. Ooh, that rhymes. I'm going to have to remember that. Uh, when the lawn gets thin, the weeds come in. Uh, another way to put it is wherever sunlight hits the soil, nature plants a weed. Nature hates bare dirt, <laughs> bare soil. And so if you don't put a plant on uh, over that, nature will. And, and uh, then here's the, the real re what's going on, really. The seeds are there, but in a dense St. Augustine lawn, they don't get enough light to germinate successfully and establish a plant. Whenever the lawn goes away a little bit and the light gets in, then those weeds that are there uh, can sprout. You know, you have weed seeds all through, all over. I mean, you just don't know that. You don't see them. But uh, they're there. And so a little moisture and a little sunlight, and, and they're in business. So anyway, that's, that's another issue, uh, which is kind of leading us into the second part of some things I wanted to talk about today. Uh, if you would like to save the other listeners from my droning on, dial 979-845-5689 or email me at gardensuccess at tamu dot edu, tamu dot edu. Uh, why don't I take a break from that just a moment and tell you about some things going on around town. Uh, the Texas A&M Women's Club Garden Interest Group. Call it the GIG. How convenient for Texas A&M. GIG them. The women's, uh, Texas A&M Women's Club Garden Interest Group uh, is going to have a program uh, where some of our master gardeners are going to be speaking. Uh, Debbie Diamond and Jim Crouch and, and uh, uh, Sue Schulke, uh, Brazos County Master Gardeners, are going to be talking about uh, propagation and how to propagate your plants. Uh, and this is a, it's a fun thing. And these, 
these folks. They've been doing trainings for our AgriLife office, uh, master gardening program for a number of years, and they really do a good job. The, the uh, topic is called The Secret to Free Plants, <laughs> and it'll be at the George Bush Presidential Library in the Education Room, uh, and the public's invited. Uh, there's no cost for it. It is on Tuesday, September 19th, so just around the corner next Tuesday, at 9.30 in the morning. And uh, you can get more information by emailing T-A-M-U-G-I-G, tamugig, at gmail.com, and find out more about that. Then, on the next Tuesday, September 26th, our Master Gardener Association is bringing in a, uh, a speaker on a very interesting topic. And the, the name of the talk is Going Grassless? Question mark. Your yard can affect the environment. And this may not be, um, you know, you, you may think with that title, you think you know what they're going to talk about, but you may be a little surprised. Um, Dr. Chang, who is a postdoctoral research associate in the Department of Soil and Crop Sciences, is going to be talking about that, a very timely topic to consider given this summer's weather. Uh, for more information on that, uh, go to brazosmg.com, brazosmg.com. Dot com, And you can find out more about that. That will be at 7 in the evening at the AgriLife Extension Office, which is right next to the Brazos County Tax Office uh, over in the uh, kind of close to Copperfield direction uh, neighborhood. So those are two talks that I definitely think will be very interesting, and you will definitely want to uh, learn more about that. Um, I am, let's see, I had a, there we go. There is, on September 16th, which is two days from now, this Saturday, there is a Learning at the Library series. It's at 10 a.m. at the Clara Mounts Library on East 26th Street in Bryan. And Kathy Paul, another Brazos County Master Gardener. We got a lot of Master Gardeners speaking all over the place. That's great. Awesome. The, the way the Master Gardener program extends extension is remarkable. There are programs all across the state of Texas, including here our Brazos County program, where wonderful people learn about all kinds of things gardening. We're doing a class, we're in the big middle of a class right now, and now I have a whole day or whole sessions on entomology and plant pathology and all kinds of other things. They really get the training. And then they go out and serve in response to that training. Uh, they, it's, a, it's a fun group to be part of, and it is, it is a, um, a real service to the community and allows extension. You have one horde agent here in Brazos County, but we got a lot of master gardeners, and they're in a lot of places doing a lot of things. So, okay, there was a master gardener commercial. Uh, on September 16th, this Saturday, learning at the library, 10 a.m., the Clara Mounts Library, 26th Street in Bryan. Kathy Paul, one of our master gardeners, is going to talk all about irises. That's the name of the presentation, all about irises. You can find out how to plant irises, how to grow these delightful plants. Uh, Kathy is a true iris aficionado, and she knows her stuff. And so if you've ever thought about growing irises, but thought, yeah, I don't know how to do that, well, come and learn. They'll also teach you, or she'll also teach you how to divide iris and you'll be able to take some home to plant in your own garden. Woo, that's that's cool. This program is free. For more information on All About Iris's program, 979-209-5600. 979-209-5600. To give you here a for some oh I wanted I wanted to talk a little bit uh, also about uh, our our water situation here uh, just because we get a little rain doesn't mean we're out of the woods and I know we've been in uh, you know uh, uh, they entered the drought stages uh, at the city of College Station and some of the other uh, water um, regions you know the Wellburn and so on uh, and and that's been a, a significant thing but don't assume that at least the amount of rain we're getting right now really breaks a drought. It may keep, it may give the grass another week, uh, you know, of water to get going. But the the soil has a huge bank account of water, and that's why we went. We started summer in the hundred degrees really early this year, and for a while our plants were doing really really well. And it's because spring watering, uh, spring um, rainfall 
had the, the soil bank account with plenty of water in it and we were able to go a long time until essentially that just kind of all got pumped dry by plant roots and by evaporating off the surface. Uh, and so uh, if you want more information, go to cstx.gov, uh, cstx.gov. That is the, the city of College Station, of course. You can, you can click your way in to the water information as well. But I wanted to mention that one thing they're going to be doing is they are, they're doing their garden in a box sale. And this is a, another group uh, used to be associated with AgriLife Extension up in Dallas. They're doing a garden in the box plant sale. So what does that mean? That means you can buy uh, a group of plants, let's say a tray of plants, that has uh, the plants that attract pollinators, for example. And there's other options like that. If you want to learn more about it, go to rootedin, rootedin.com slash shop rootedin.com slash shop shop you make your orders now and, and don't delay it it's there it's almost we're almost on the delivery time because the pickup of those is going to be on september 23rd at the gary halter nature center out in lick creek park so rootedin.com to find out more about the plant uh, uh, boxes that are going to be made available through the City of College Station Water uh, Department, the Water Conservation Program, and and all the things that Jennifer Nations does there. By the way, she her show is on every Wednesday here on KAMU. It's called Waterful Wednesdays. Waterful Wednesdays, 7:42 a.m. I like that time. 742 that that's very specific uh, but Jennifer comes on and talks about all kinds of things that are related to water you can go to the KAMU website uh, KAMU FM website and look do a search for waterful Wednesdays there are past shows there just like there's past shows of garden line you can listen to past waterful Wednesdays. so if you miss one you can go ahead and listen to it and so I think that that's probably uh, I think that's probably it for the news. Uh, of course, we always promote our local uh, farmers markets, the South Brazos County Farmers Market on the corner of University and Glen Haven. That is out University, almost to the bypass on the right. Uh, and it's across from the Scott and White Clinic out there. And that is on Tuesdays, noon to 5 on uh, the South Brazos County Farmers Market. Also has a market on Fridays, noon to 5, same location. The Brazos Valley Farmers Market is 8 a.m. to noon, downtown Bryan at Main and 21st. Uh, and if you've never gone to one of these farmers markets, you ought to go. There, there's often, like the Brazos Valley, I've, I've been out there where there's a couple of food trucks or one or two food trucks. There's music going on and things. They're, they're just a lot of fun. And plus, you get to meet a lot of local regional farmers and uh, see their produce. And so you can find out a lot more information there. Uh, then there's Farm Fridays out on Tabor Road. Uh, and this is 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at 2861 FM 974. That's Tabor Road. And there's all kinds of things like plants and eggs and dog treats and, and other kinds of items like you would find in a market uh, as well. Uh, so you know, promote our farmers markets out there as we do this. Well, our phone number is 979-845-5689. 979-845-5689. Uh, oh, I just, it's interesting, uh, Ron from the, the last farmers market I was talking about uh, had just sent me an email that uh, there's a new farmers market called Aggieland Farmers Market starting this Saturday from 8 a.m. to noon just inside the entrance to Post Oak Mall off the access road of Highway 6. So if you come in from the Highway 6 side, uh, just inside the entrance, Saturday, 8 a.m. to noon, uh, about 15, 20 vendors will be there. This first first time, brand new market, Aggieland Farmer's Market. So my goodness, uh, if you can't find a farmer's market or two or three or four or five, uh, you're not trying. Uh, this That's really good. It's good for our farmers, good for our community. Uh, it's just it's just a good outing too. I always like to to get out there uh, and do that. I uh, had a um, an announcement that I did want to make. Uh, the Twin Oaks Landfill they're having a household hazardous waste collection event. So here's your chance to get uh, some of those products that you don't want to pour down the drain. You don't want to dump on the soil. Uh, and if you want more information, here's the phone number, 
3809. Uh, and if you're missing any of this, it'll be up on the past shows on KAMU-FM. It is Saturday, October 21st, rain or shine, 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. And uh, so that uh, is important because if, if what what you need to do is you need to go online or give them a call and find out what they do and don't take. For example, on the yes, we'll take it, uh, automotive fluids, household cleaning agents, uh, cooking oil, compact fluorescent light bulbs. Those are one like, what do we do with this? We know that stuff's not good to get up in the atmosphere. Uh, paint thinners and, and aerosol cans and batteries and even computers. They don't take medication. They don't take your household garbage. Uh, they don't take appliances that have Freon in them or tires or ammunition or, you know, go, go online and look at it. But this is a really good opportunity to uh, make sure those products are dealt with in a proper way. And again, household hazardous waste at Twin Oaks Landfill. Okay, I wanted to go to the emails. <clears throat> Had an email uh, come in uh, from uh, Stephen. Uh, no, excuse me, I'm on the wrong date here. Uh, from Sandy about the rain barrels. I had talked about the the Master Gardeners having a rain barrel event coming up and uh, that, that of course there's a charge to come to the event uh, but uh, I just want to be clear the Master Gardeners aren't selling rain barrels. This is this is an event that when you register and come to the event in your registration, you can get a rain barrel. But here's what you need to do. You need to call the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Office uh, or dr drop in out there and uh, speak to someone about the Master Gardener rain barrel event. And that way, uh, you can get the information you need and get registered and everything for that. Uh, it's it's important uh, to do that. So if you're not coming to the event, it's not like there's just rain barrels for sale. That That's not how it works. Hopefully that uh, is clear. Mary emailed about a Nandina that basically turned yellow and browning, and she cut it back to about two feet, kind of wondering, what now? What do we do here? Uh, is this, you know, have we done the right thing? Or, or uh, you know, what? What 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 is next? Well, Nandina is a unique uh, plant when it comes to how we prune them. With a lot of shrubs, we're pruning the branches of the shrub. We'll cut them back, and then they'll sprout new branches and grow out sideways and upward and everything. Nandinas are like bamboo in a sense, and uh, they they have canes. We call them. It's a shoot that comes out of the ground and goes up to a certain height depending on the genetics of the plant. There's dwarf ones and tall ones. And if you just cut them back, they don't look right and they don't really branch well. And so what we generally do is with a healthy Nandina, as it's getting larger, if you want to manage it somewhat, you can cut maybe about a fifth of those canes back each year. It's not a have to, but you can. Uh, and that way you still have a, a robust plant uh, and you're getting the old canes that are not as attractive anymore. The foliage is old and so on. Uh, you're getting those cleaned out of there. Now, in the case of what happens when the whole Nandina turns yellow and brown, now it's ugly. Uh, well, you can cut it all the way back to the ground. If there is not uh, living tissue on it, uh, then there's even a chance that it may not re-sprout uh, and has just been killed by drought. But this year we've had a lot of just damage on plants that somewhere inside that plant they're still alive. So if you cut it back with a good watering, uh, you can get some re-sprouts. Again, with a weakened plant, uh, we generally don't prune a weakened plant. But if there's no leaves up there, just get all the ugly out. And if it's brown, cut it down and uh, just go back to a fresh new growth. And it'll it'll be set back. but. It wasn't you that did it. It was the, it was the drought. You're you're just removing all the brown stuff. Uh, so that that would be a, a way of managing that. Uh, putting compost around it on the surface, kind of as a little mulch and some other mulch, is good. Keeps the soil moist. Uh, but a good deep soaking on a very infrequent basis. Don't immediately just jump to fertilizing it. A lot of times we assume fertilizer fixes lack of plant growth problems. And while fertilizing with a lawn fertilizer, which is what I would use on, on, on these kinds of shrubs and things as well, uh, 
while it provides nitrogen that helps support new growth, more vigor, uh, it, it, it is the, the plant itself that is wanting to grow. The conditions are right. It just needs the nutrient. In the case of something like this, the soil, it was doing just fine before all this damage. And it can come out just fine. To, to put a whole lot of fertilizer on it, it's, you, number one, you can burn plants with excessive amounts of salt-based fertilizers. But just, just let it get going a little bit, and then a little bit moderate. I, we're moving into the wintertime. Uh, Nandina is generally hardy here, but I hate to fertilize things so that in late October and through November, there's still some succulent growth that hasn't hardened off properly. That's where we get into the cold damage. That's what happened to our crepe myrtles. Uh, this past year when the December freeze that was very cold, a very hard freeze down in the mid-teens, uh, when it hit, they were not ready. They had not prepared. So I, I would not jump to fertilizing these drought and heat, uh, heat damaged uh, shrubs right now. In the spring, as we start to see new growth and they're, they're wanting to get going, then go ahead and do that. But uh, they're, you know, don't think that, that fertilizer is going to replace something else. An another example of that, by the way, is in the lawn. You know, people are, they have grass that's in a lot of shade under a tree and the grass is thin. And so we know fertilizer and stimulates growth, right? Well, you can't replace sunlight with fertilizer either. And so th think of the plant. I think I've used this analogy before, but I, I think it's a good one. Uh, think of the plant leaf as like an automobile factory. And you've got all these metal and rubber and glass parts that are being delivered to the plant. And then they take those and they have a uh, electric power uh, assembly line where the cars are moving down and they're putting together a car. And at the other end, you open up the door and the cars go out. And we've got brand new cars on the road. Think the, the plant leaf is similar. Your roots are taking up water and nutrients. And your plant is also producing some plant food, which is carbohydrates, that supports a lot of plant growth functions. But they're going up to the leaves. The sun shines on the leaves. That's the equivalent of the electricity in the, in the plant. And then it goes through all the biological processes of making carbohydrates and all kinds of things that the plant needs to grow and do well. When we get drought and uh, it's so dry, the plant is closing its stomates to not let that water out because it can't get enough water, well, that's like shutting the doors at the end of the factory. The car can't get out until the doors open up. Uh, the lack of sunlight from shade or from a lack of leaves because you've lost the leaves, now there is no factory in process going on. And if, if you kind of will think about plants uh, in, in that way, it kind of helps you understand things. It helps you understand why don't you get a lot of tomatoes if you put a plant in the shade. Uh, and so, yes, we need water and nutrients. Those are the parts that are going in to be part of the assembly process. Uh, but uh, the water and nu the nutrients that you put on the ground, fertilizer, is not plant food. I know we refer to it that way, but plant food is what's produced in the factory. That is what is plant food. Fertilizer are the parts that are sent to help the plant produce plant food. That's at least my way of looking at it. I, I don't know that, you know, need a turf specialist call in and correct me on that one if uh, if I'm wrong on that. Uh, anyway, we're going to go to the phones now. The number is 845-5689, and we're going to talk to David. Hello, David. Hello, Skip. How are you doing? Well, I'm doing better today with the rainfall. Well, good. <laughs> yeah. uh, we didn't get enough uh, so far where we are to do much good, but, but hopefully more is on the way. Yeah. Uh, uh, you talked about grass and uh so i thought i would throw something out there i've, I've been looking for i've had chinch bugs fairly frequently and so i was looking for a metaclopred base because that seemed to be a good option because it's systemic and all that and doesn't necessarily kill everything else uh i haven't located any l lately but i did run across something uh that got Chloran, Tran, Iprol, Iprol, yeah. which I'm sure I'm looking at. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. I do. It's a, yeah, okay. It is a, an insecticide. Well, and I, when I was reading it, it talked about all the things that it would kill. It was like it was mostly for grubs, which, of course, some people have that. But uh, it said instead of killing, it said suppresses chinch bugs. And 
and I actually bought it for more because I've had a grasshopper plague the last two or three years that have just been awful, and it's supposed to possibly also deal with uh, the grasshopper nymphs because we've had them horribly uh, the last few years. So uh, just long story short, uh, I went ahead and put some out uh, as chinch, for chinch bugs. Uh, not that I'd spotted any, so I might have been premature, but of course, systemic and all that, you want to kind of, you know, like, like you said, sometimes you got to kind of go early. One of the things that attracted me to it when I read up on it was that it's apparently very low toxi- toxicity to a whole lot of things and doesn't kill everything. And apparently you've got to chew on the uh, plants or, or whatever. It just sounded like if you read about it, it's very low toxicity, which is good. So, so I put it out, coincidence or not, I haven't had any chinch bugs. Um, that doesn't mean my lawn looks great because it, you know, the drought and all that. I've kept it alive. So I just really was just calling to get your opinion on that, if how much you knew about it, as opposed to other options such as imidacloprid, which, as I said, I, I'm having trouble even finding it. I guess I could order, order it online or something. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll let you talk. Well, I am not a pesticide expert. Uh, but I can tell you that chlortranoprol is um, uh, it is a synthetic insecticide. Uh, it's based on, uh, we used to have some old organic products that are now off the market uh, for toxicity reasons. But uh, Ryania is one of those uh, products that is now off uh, the market. And it's based on the extract of one of those plants. It's a South American plant and I believe it grows in some other areas as well. But chlorotranoprol works pretty well. I've not seen the label to to look at everything. If it says it suppresses chinch bugs, that sounds to me like it's not doing a a complete job on chinch bugs or for whatever reason. And again, I always invite anybody from the departments and stuff listening, please call in and enlighten us if you uh, can give some more information about that. Uh, It is a uh, it's a, the kind of product that uh, we generally don't worry a lot about the toxicity on it, uh, but uh, of course most things coming out today they're you know they're <clears throat> less toxic than a lot of the older things when people didn't seem to be as concerned about that kind of thing. But I'm, I'm not I know that it it works somehow inside the plant uh, some way related to calcium releasing or I, I don't know I think the muscle cells uh, on the insect I said the plant on the insect uh, muscle cells start leaking calcium and <clears throat> paralyzes the insects and things uh, well, if, d- you go to, if you if you go to most places where you can get stuff whether it's the box stores or whatever it, most of the stuff that's marketed for your lawn now is just it kills everything and mm-hmm. I'm not sure I'm ready to kill everything uh, and, yeah. and this it's clearly not supposed to kill everything, so yes. I, you know, that was that attracted me to it. Yeah, well, and you know that's that's fair. It's always better to use an arrow than a grenade when possible, yeah. uh, and so the, you're you're aiming for an arrow there. Uh, the imidacloprid will kill a lot of different things too, uh, just being present there, but uh, it is primarily working systemically. My only concern with imidacloprid, and I've talked about this on the air before is it is taken up by tree roots. And so uh, crepe myrtles are one of our number one bee um, supporting plants in the heat of the summertime. So having a metacloprid in a system uh, of, the, of the tree uh, that you applied maybe to the lawn and it got into some of the roots, that, that would be a, a possible concern that I would have. But I know, you know, in, in the case of my yard right now, I'm looking at a yard that I will not have if I don't do something about it and probably should have done something about it actually a, a long time ago when they first got started. Uh, and so that that's kind of a rescue treatment. Uh, and generally with, with chinch bugs, they're going to, as I described, like a fire burning out in the forest, they're going to be in sort of a, a range, uh, where not in the dead, not in, you know, 10 feet forward in the healthy. But there's a little range in there, maybe a strip of five feet or so where you would do your treatment. And so you're not like nuking the whole yard uh, when you're going after uh, the chinch bugs in most cases. Well, uh, I just thought I'd see what you knew about it. If, if anybody does uh, know more that would uh, give us, uh, I'm sure I'm not the only one would be interested in knowing if that particular product, which I was able to buy locally, mm-hmm. was at Home Depot, I don't mind saying where, uh, that 
it's called GrubX or something like that. But mm-hmm. uh, but it, be interested in knowing more about if the, any tests or, or uh, field tests or whatever about how how effective it was with chinch bugs because okay. I don't want to keep using it if, it's, if it doesn't really work. So I just thought I'd pass that along. Yeah, I'll I'll kind of poke around here. If we get another call, it gives me a chance to 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 do a search on on the chinch bug publication. Uh, I'll see if that's right. on there. Uh, but thanks for the call, David. Appreciate that. Sure. And, right. Yes. Good. Good thoughts uh, there. So uh, we were talking about uh, the trifecta that I've been dealing with in my yard, and many of you are at least some of those three things are dealing with as well. Uh, and then uh, also the fact that large patch is uh, the thing that enters when it cools off, and we have to deal with those. Uh, so our our goal is, you know, how do we you know, how do we get our lawns back? Uh, because so many lawns uh, are absolutely hammered right now, and they need to be they need to recover. Uh, I, w- I want to just remind you though that to do a heavy fertilization again going into the fall on a plant that is uh, already doesn't have uh, that good of a root system in many cases is probably not that. Uh, advisable. Now I have used 312 fertilizers in the fall for years. I've done that and and it's um, you know the it, it's easy to 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 uh, get good growth and keep your lawn dense and that is really the goal of what we're looking at. But uh, the fall season is a little bit different and if I were to say what's a good ideal fertilizer for fall it would be one where that nitrogen in the ratio it's so high in 312. Three times as much nitrogen as phosphorus, twice as much potassium as phosphorus. That's 312. We don't need three times as much nitrogen in the fall. We do need a good supply of uh, potassium, the last number. So I look at more for something like a one-to-one ratio of nitrogen to potassium. Nitrogen is still needed. I think they're, they may be taken up together in the plant, but I, I know we still need some nitrogen, but not not a whole lot. But what the potassium does for the grass plant and other plants is it helps increase uh, drought tolerance. The the plant's normal processes that help it uh, deal with uh, dealing with drought, uh, that is potassium is important for that. Potassium also helps in cold tolerance in plants and our St. Augustine normally it's cold hardy here uh, but there not all varieties are equal and uh, you can get a little bit of coal damage on it in a bad winter, and so it helps with that as well. And with that in mind, uh, something that we need to remember about our grass plants is how they go go into and come out of the winter time. When you get your grass in decent shape with good nutrition, especially like that potassium number, a little more of the potassium, uh, going into winter, it's Think of it as like antifreeze in the grass plant, but also it's a storage of growth supporting uh, compounds. And so when spring comes, the grass is not putting new roots down uh, uh, much, if any at all, in fe- January, February, uh, and even getting into March, uh, there there's not a, a lot of initial root growth. Uh, and the old roots are not doing their job much uh, by that time. And so as it warms up and grass growth can speed up because of the temperature, uh, then it's putting new roots out and can take up a lot of nutrients. But how did the plant survive in those early days, the transition into, okay, now we're getting a bunch of fresh new roots? It survived by what we did in the fall. It it survived by what it had going into the cool season. That's why uh, I had a turf specialist tell me one time that uh, the fall fertilization was the most important one of the year. And at the time, I kind of thought, okay, that... It's overstating it. And I'm not a turf specialist, but uh, it, let's just say this. It is a very important fertilization for our grass, and especially our lawns that are weak now going into the winter time or late fall time due to the heat and drought, especially the drought. Uh, and so I would say that's an important fertilization to get down this fall. And when do we do it? Uh, here in the Bryan College Station area, you could do that in late September. You could do that in early October. I wouldn't go past much early October if you have a choice, if you're able to choose. Um, but because as we go into fall, 
by the time we're in November, the grass itself, the root system is kind of shutting down a little bit and it's not going to take up uh, as actively take up nutrients from the soil. So fertilizing in November is, is kind of, yeah, there's going to be some fertilizer in the soil, but that it's not going to do as much good to the grass plant as if you did it. Uh, we get a couple of rains and it's going to grow and get a little active again. Boy, that's a great time in uh, late September, maybe early October, uh, to go ahead and get that down on the ground. Well, that's a lot of talk about grass, isn't it? Our phone number, 845-5689, 845 56 I had a question from Shelby come in on uh, the, she's going to or has been purchasing an, uh, one of those kits that I was talking about from the College Station Water Department, the rootedin.com slash shop uh, kits. And theirs was for a pollinator garden. And uh, so they're wanting to put in uh, plants and looking at an area that has weeds and maybe some other desirable plants in it. But um, how do you prep it up? Well, first of all, I'd look over the weeds. And if you have something that is a noxious perennial weed, like Bermuda grass is probably example number one on that. When you till up Bermuda grass and then you wet the soil, you have just propagated it by making cuttings everywhere with, with they have their own roots already most likely. And it just comes back with a vengeance. And when you have Bermuda in any kind of a garden or flower bed, it, it's just a pain to deal with when you got your good plants in there that you want to, th to survive. So I'd make sure that if anything like that is in there, uh, if it's something like Bermuda that has the underground rhizomes, uh, I would make sure and uh, spray it and kill it before I did anything. Uh, otherwise, just rototilling it is fine. I would rototill it, and then I would put about two inches of compost. This is a brand new bed, and so we're assuming that the soil itself is not in that impressive of shape. Uh, we're going to go ahead and put about a couple inches of compost and mix it in really well, uh, and then plant and water it in really well. Uh, and then hold off right now on fertilizing. In the spring, you can do some fertilizing. You probably have enough nutrient. And when you add two inches of compost, you got a lot of nutrient there uh, as well. So that is, I think, the main thing you could do. The other thing I would suggest is to mulch it right away when you get the plants in. Uh, we are about to enter the cool season. And in the cool season, all our cool season weeds start to sprout. Think of the blue bonnet. You know, we you probably know we plant blue bonnet seeds in the fall. They sprout and they sit there as little, we call them rosettes, little small plants through the winter time. Not much growth, a little bit. But in spring, they take off with big plants with blooms everywhere and setting seed. That's what your winter weeds are doing. So if you can, and, it, it, and it's hard to control them once they hit that spring stage. Uh, so if you mulch really well, you can just avoid that whole process. And that's going to start happening in October, the beginning of October. Every year is different because our soil temps can vary with the weather. Uh, but certain soil temperatures for a certain period of time, uh, each weed has its own sweet spots. And that's when they start to germinate. So that would be henbit, and that would be chickweed, and that would be carpetweed. Uh, and uh, what's the one that clings to you? Um, cleavers. That's called one. One name for it is cleavers. There's others. Uh, annual bluegrass is another one. So getting the mulch down just means you just took care of all of them, and you dealt with the perennials ahead of time. So you basically have a weed-free bed, and that saves you a lot of uh, stooping over and, and pulling weeds. So I think anybody that's doing any kind of soil work on beds, whether it's a vegetable garden or perhaps it is a, um, a flower bed or something like that, uh, yeah, it's, it's a good, good idea to go ahead and deal with those weeds sooner rather than later. Uh, I had a, an email come in, and let me see if I can get the text open to it. Okay, why are my chrysanthemums so yellow? Uh, and I don't have a name on this one. But uh, if you look at the chrysanthemums, and I, I'm going to describe this because what I'm describing on chrysanthemum is what it is on all plants uh, uh, in your lawn and garden, well, in your garden. Uh, it's yellowing almost to the point of being white, newish growth, new growth tips. So as you go down the shoot, and the older the leaf gets, the greener it gets. But out at the end of the shoot, it's either almost bleached white or it's yellowing, or what's even more common is we see green veins and yellow all around the veins. 
uh, and that is iron deficiency. And iron deficiency can be caused by a lack of iron. I would suggest in most cases, you probably don't have a lack of iron in your soil. Uh, but if the phosphorus is high and if the pH is high, that iron gets tied up and it's not available. It's there. But, you know, if you took a nail and stuck it in a flower pot, it is not going to provide iron for that plant in any reasonable amount of time or way. Uh, it's not the right form of iron, rust. Oxidized iron is not uh, that. So what you will want to do is buy a chelated iron, and you can buy that from, you know, local uh, supplier of those kinds of things. A chelated iron and apply it to the soil, follow the label, and that will help cure it. Now, another thing that can cause iron deficiency is soggy wet soil conditions or anything that kills roots. Iron is taken up in the root tip of the plant, so like take all root rot. My grass, my yard I was describing, uh, has a lot of yellowing shoots on it. And uh, the, in grass, it, the, if you hold a grass blade up to the light, you see stripes of green and yellow across the grass blade. As you, the stripes are going the length of the blade, but it's just like you know a striped green and striped yellow, uh, and that's iron deficiency. And so in grass, uh, soggy conditions, cool soil can do it. St. Augustine's a little prone to iron deficiency. Uh, but um, yeah, you got you to gotta get some iron down on it uh, and help it to do better. But a disease, take all root rot on the grass, any kind of root disease can cause an iron deficiency with a moderate amount of damage. You know, you can, if it's a root rot that completely kills a plant, that's a whole other thing. Uh, but just remember that it's going to be one of those things. Uh, and thank you for those pictures, very excellent pictures on those. Our phone number, 979-845-5689, 979-845-5689. And I'm going to take a look here at a number of other things. I uh, had a, uh, some pictures come in uh, on a uh, lantana. Uh, lantana's got brown areas on the leaves, and that is a, a leaf miner. Leaf miners occur on a lot of different kinds of plants. Uh, you'll see them on your pepper plants. You'll see them in this case. There's one on lantana. I've seen them on figs. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I actually have. Uh, also, okra and other things. Okra is not a normal. Tomatoes are very common. It's a little fly that lays an egg in the leaf, and that larva hatches and tunnels between the top and bottom surface of the leaf. So you see this squiggly serpentine line going around through the leaf. And as it goes, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger because the larva is getting bigger. Bigger mouth, bigger larva, eating more leaf. And uh, then it pupates and falls to the soil. And here we go again. Most of the time, leaf miners are not even worth worrying about. They, they come and go. They don't take enough of the leaves out to create a, damp, a significant damage to the plant, so we don't worry about that. Uh, it's just something we don't really need to worry about. Also, uh, Shannon sent a picture of a fig with uh, two symptoms. One is browning of the tips and margins of the leaves. That is lack of water. Uh, and one way or another, figs can get nematodes, so there's another way that water is not able to get through the roots and up into the plant at the rate that it, it needs to. There's also some leaf spots. You know, we are, we're about to lose these fig leaves, and we don't need to worry about spraying them now. What is is, uh, I would just, when the leaves fall, I would rake up and get rid of, bury, destroy, compost, whatever. Uh, I, I would just get rid of them, uh, all these leaves, because they are sources of reinfection, uh, and especially if it's a disease called rust, which I don't, the symptoms don't look like rust to me on this particular fig. Uh, phone number again, 845-5689, or email garden success. In fact, I don't have time today to get, uh, to take new emails in, uh, garden success at tamu dot edu. Uh, Shannon, uh, here's another uh, question. Uh, it's, uh, they have a bed that is in full sun, and there's wildflowers growing in it, and wanted to know if I mulch to keep the weeds down, um, uh, how do your wildflowers grow? Well, they don't germinate under mulch. They, you know, we call plants weeds because we don't want them where they're growing. <laughs> now, if for, how about this? If you put St. Augustine in your vegetable garden and it was crawling around, St. Augustine would be a weed because we don't want grass in the vegetable garden. Uh, so weed is a, a matter of perspective. Uh, and so blue bonnets, we don't think of them as weeds, but 
you know, these plants, like the weeds, or just seeds coming out of the ground, you need to let the bluebonnets get up and growing. I would, uh, if you if they haven't sprouted, you could use something to kill the, the weeds on the surface uh, with a spray and then let the bluebonnets come up. And once they get going, you can do some weeding around them or some mulching in around them, but you can't put mulch down now. That's just That's just kind of the way things are. It's always a good idea when you're going to plant to get rid of the weeds first so that as you go forward, uh, it's real easy to uh, to do. One last email. We're about out of time for today. Uh, one last email is uh, from Kelly. Uh, Kelly sends a picture of a lawn that is uh, in bleak shape. The uh, grass plants are kind of spotted through there. There are not many plants. They're yellow. Uh, it looks to me like soil compaction is at play, so a good deep aeration followed by another compost top dressing would be helpful. But the weeds you're seeing are slender aster, and slender aster is a deep, dark, almost gr greenish, bluish green uh, plant. Yeah, drive around town, see lawns that are almost dead, and you see these big green things in the lawn. That's often, especially a bluish, almost bluish green. Uh, that's slender aster, and uh, it is going to bloom soon, and each little bloom will have 50 or more seeds. I actually counted one once, and it maybe have 100 blooms on it, and so you got to get those things out of here because once they do that, you can't spray. The, when the weed gets reproductive, it's less responsive to sprays that we want to control it with. I pull mine up. When the soil is moist, you got to moisten the soil, uh, they come up. They come out of one central, central taproot. So this slender aster plant may be two feet across in your lawn, uh, but it's coming out of one place, and you can kind of grab it and wiggle it sideways as you pull a uh, little bit at a time. I'll do it every Saturday morning, you know, for a little bit of pulling here and there on one side of the yard where there's a lot of those weeds. So don't let the slender asters go to seed unless you're just a person that doesn't care if the lawn's perfect. Uh, a lot of people say, well, these weeds have blooms that attract bees, and so I'm going to leave them. Okay, it's your yard. Go for it. Because uh, it's true. They do. They do have blooms and attract uh, bees. Well, you've been listening to the Garden Line. Uh, we will be back next Thursday. I uh, appreciate you listening in. And uh, tell your friends about the show. Check us out online. You can listen to past shows there. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, if you want to send some emails, when we get back to the next show, I will be looking at those and reading them, and we'll discuss them on the air. You've been listening to Garden Success with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Skip Richter. Join us again next week as Skip discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley.